my great pleasure uh, to start by introducing Douglas White, a member and former chief of the Sunamuk Nanaimo First Nation, British Columbia. His Coast Salish name is Kowasilton. Kowasilton. And his Nichalnath name is Klishin. Klishin. Thank you. <laughs> After completing his BA in First Nation Studies with distinction from Malaspina University College, which we, uh, yeah, you used to be, uh, before that it was uh, Malaspina, uh, he graduated from the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria in 2006 and was called to the Bar of British Columbia in January 2008. He has been director of the Indigenous Bar Association of Canada and an associate lawyer at Mandel Pinder. Douglas was elected chief of the Sunamuk First Nation from December 2009 to February 2014, where a major focus of his work related to the implementation of the Sunamuk Treaty of 1854. From June of 2010 to 2013, he was elected by Chiefs of British Columbia to lead the First Nations Summit as a member of the First Nations Summit Task Force. In that capacity, he advocated for First Nations seeking resolution of outstanding issues with the Crown. In that role, he was also a member of the BC First Nations Leadership Council, working on areas of shared interest with BC First Nations, particularly the Crown's duty to consult and accommodate. He also advocated on their behalf with the governments of BC, Canada, and internationally at the United Nations. Douglas is currently the director of uh, BIU's Center for Pre-Confederation Treaties and Reconciliation and practices as, as a lawyer and negotiator across the country for First Nations governments. He's recently been elected counselor for the Sunam of First Nation and he frequently lectures at universities on indigenous legal issues. Uh, without further ado, please Thank help you. me welcome Douglas White. <coughs> Asiam Nasiaya, Ain't the Pak Polasultan Tanis the Nemo, I Meshqual and Connas Ihi, Haitsepka, Haitsepka, Siam Nestimo, Haitsepka, Kawachin Nestimo. Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug White, Polasultan. I want to begin by uh, thanking the elders, the singers, for opening us up in such a good way. Really want to acknowledge my Kawachin relations that were gathered up in their territory for this important discussion and work. I really want to thank Warren for the invitation and the other organizers for me to come and share a few words with you. I think this is such a, an important topic, an important issue. It's one that doesn't get a lot of attention from uh, people that are in my kind of work and position, you know, legal and political and all that kind of stuff. The issue of work and the quality of work, the, the fact of the need of reconciliation to manifest in the workplace. You know, there's um, this, uh, I was recently appointed to the Justice Council of British Columbia, the Aboriginal Justice Council of British Columbia, and it has two key mandate areas. One, the over-representation of our children in, in care that have been taken out of their families, and then two, the over-representation of our people in jails. And, uh, you know, today we're in part, we're a little bit talking about the, over, the under representation of our people in the workforce. And I think that these are obviously all interrelated issues. They're all different sides of the same coin that's been at play in this country. They're all sort of the miserable manifestations of something. And this is, I think, what we have to think about and talk about. You know, the work, I think, is such an important part of our lived lives. How we look after ourselves, how we look after our families, how we contribute to our community. The way that we think about ourselves, you know, who, who am I, is so wrapped up in the work that we do. I'm an educator, I'm a lawyer, I'm a this or a that, whatever it may be is an important foundation of our sense of self. It's an important foundation of our sense, ultimately, of well-being and our health. 
emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Um, you know, we're, uh, this presentation is really, it's only got a few different slides. I'm not sure how to I'll come over here and figure out how to move through it. It's got just a few different, I, I want to share just a few stories mm -hmm. at the outset of this. Because I think to understand each of these facets, we have to clearly understand the broad trajectory of the, of the overarching narratives of our country, of, of our shared experience of the indigenous peoples of this part of the world and of the country that's become Canada and what are the, what are the different uh, ebb and flows of the relationship, what are the fundamentals of the relationship and what's the, what, do we, uh, what do we know about the moment that we're in? I think it says up here somewhere that we're in a defining moment of reconciliation. It's not necessarily a moment of reconciliation but it is a defining moment and I think it truly is an important part of the work of the people in this room to make sure that it does become a moment of reconciliation. My overwhelming sort of experience in the last number of years has been that people are really confused about the moment that we're in. People are really struggling as individual human beings but also as members of governments, as members of both First Nations and Aboriginal governments, as uh, administrators, bureaucrats, people don't know what to do. People really don't know what to do. And there's a number of different um, streams of reconciliation, of potential reconciliation that I want to uh, turn your minds to and I want you to think about that I think are necessary to understand things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What a, what a remarkable uh, bit of work that was over a major number of years on such an important issue in our history. A very specific issue about the residential school experience. One that was born out of a very specific uh, process or initiative Right, the some of the like I, I was trained in law, and law is an ugly, hyper adversarial space. Right, the legal process mm -hmm. it's about uh, dragging people into a forum where you're going to beat them up effectively in a legal way. It's not, it's probably the last place you ever want to be. If what you want at the end of the day is reconciliation, probably don't drag people into the courts. Right, uh, the whole worldview, the underlying assumptions, the whole paradigm of the law in the Western legal tradition is about uh, separateness. It's about someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. That's the underlying basic mythology of the Canadian legal process. Hyper adversarial. But so the, Res the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was born out of that. Melvin Good and others from Sanemo, other peoples from the island that had spent part of their lives in the Alberni Indian Residential School had been abused there in horrific ways. They decided uh, sometime uh, close to a generation ago that, you know what, what happened to me was not right. That was not right in any way. The people that did those things to us need to be held to be accountable. And so they brought them to court and they launched what, I mean, what a remarkable thing. I mean, let's keep in mind now, there's been residential schools for a very long period of time, close to a century. There have been, uh, you know, the, I think about, I always think about my, my uncle, uh, Ron Hamilton. He did work on the Alberni, on, on the New Channel Residential School Oral History Project. He interviewed hundreds of uh, residential school survivors in the, in the years after Melvin and others brought that <coughs> litigation. Like, we better, we better find out what happened. We better talk to people and ask them. Nobody talks about what happened there. We better talk about it. But I remember what he said about... Um, he said something to me about uh, Edward Sapir. Does anybody know linguistics? Edward Sapir, one of the great linguists in history, 
the superior wharf hypothesis, brilliant man. Well, he spent time uh, studying the Nuchanok peoples on the west coast of Vancouver Island. He knew that he studied the language. He was uh, fluent in the Nuchanok language. And believe it or not, he taught one of his young students, Morris Swadesh, how to speak the Nuchanok language in New York City, Manhattan. <laughs> he became a fluent speaker of the Nuchanok language on the other side of the uh, continent. And he came over uh, this Morris Swadesh and uh, he got on a bus. My uncle tells this interesting story too about uh, how uh, his mother was on this bus that Morris Swadesh got on. And Morris is like, oh, jeez, I think that, uh, I'm pretty sure that lady's in Uchano. I think I'm going to go and talk to her. So he went over and he started talking. And he said, uh, Uncle Ron said, it scared the hell out of his mother. <laughs> what, uh, who's, what's going on here? She thought he was a ghost. How is it possible this person uh, can speak our language in this way? It was so unsettling. That's how intimately Edward Sapir knew one aspect of who we were. And he wrote volumes about the Nuchanok people. Volumes upon volumes. And the comment that I found interesting that Uncle Ron shared with me, for whatever reason, it's always stuck in my head is that there isn't a single reference in all of those volumes to the fact. You know, they were a lot of them were ethnographies. Who are these people? What's their story? There's not a single reference to the fact that there were no children in those communities. Hundreds and hundreds of pages of discussion from an academic perspective about a people. Not one reference. Total uh, like, like a reflection of the societal blindness to the obvious. Something's up here, something's wrong. And I say all of that because the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think they rightfully, uh, they, they put a lot of really sharp focus on the education system in this country in two different ways. And one, they said, the education system in this country was used as a weapon against indigenous peoples to destroy them. <coughs> Isn't that disgusting and gross to think? Such a sacred duty, such a beautiful thing to teach, to help people become who they are, to learn, to grow, that it was so horribly disfigured as a, as a, as a whole sort of thing that it became used in an ugly way to serve some ugly purpose. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission rightfully noted, yes, it was very successful. It was very powerful in its whole system, what it did, taking children away from their families, and putting them in these institutions. And um, doing its ugly work. And they said, now, equally in this moment and in this time, having just said that, they talked about uh, the potential and the opportunity and the power and, in fact, the duty of the education system to repair that harm that's been done, that it has a very important role. Education for Reconciliation is the name of those chapters. I said, as ugly and as damaging as it's been, it can also be wielded in a powerful and important way. And they, so the, the, those are the two sharp focuses. One, there's real responsibility. And two, there's massive opportunity and duty to uptake and to, to respond to these calls to action. And I think that, so I say all of that because I think that the work that you do is extremely important as educators, as people that work in the academic context. Because as I said at the beginning, I think people are really struggling with this particular moment. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to move. They don't know what the world looks like. 
ahead of us. There's absolute total certainty in the status quo. We know damn well if we do nothing, <laughs> if we change nothing, if we take no risks, then we know that things as they are will continue to be the same. And that provides a lot of comfort. I'm going to talk about um, you know, the legal, the economic, the political, and the social dimensions of the relationship and try and understand something about them. Uh, you know, big picture, there's been a big shift where at the outset of the relationship, the formal, where I'm from in Snanemo and where we're at now, Cowich, and have, have had different histories and experiences with the crown, really different. In, um, in 1854, my people entered into the last, the very last treaty, a pre-Confederation treaty here on Vancouver Island. And the reason they did that was for a number of things. First, uh, what I want to talk about is the, the basic legal reality and understanding that was not even controversial at the time, that prior to settlement you have to establish proper relations with indigenous peoples. That's not even a controversial statement in the 1840s, 1850s. We know that things like Aboriginal title exist. We know that Indigenous peoples have uh, the continuing rights in relation to them. And that we know that if we're going to arrive and if we're going to create a, establish a colony, that part of the essential work of that is to establish a proper legal and political relationship. That was one, one aspect. The second one was about economic development. Part of the stuff that's at the foundation of work. <laughs> the Crown wanted to, you know, it was struggling to find an economic foundation. It realized there was coal at home in Slanemo. And uh, the, prior to, doesn't that, that, that sounds pretty current, doesn't it? The crown's desperate for revenue. It knows that there's some revenue in somewhere in the world. And then, so then the next thing is, so before you go and do that, you need to establish a proper relationship, respect, a recognition, a consent, consent to relations. That was uh, just a matter of course back then. Now, well, so what happened after 1854? So we established the treaty one of the Douglas treaties they're called after James Douglas, who was the governor of that particular moment. Um, treaties of recognition and respect, mutuality, nation to nation. One of the overarching premises of the treaty was uh, non-interference. That look, you know, if we, if we come and take this coal, we are not gonna interfere with your way of life. Douglas wrote in letters around the treaties he talked about how he shared with the First Nations that uh, their way, way of life would continue as when, uh, before we arrived. And in, in the text of the treaty itself, it talks about the right to carry on our fisheries as formerly. The, you know, so very, a very specific kind of relationship that's premised on the idea that Aboriginal title exists, mm -hmm. that Aboriginal peoples matter, that the relationship matters, that we matter to each other, that our lives are wrapped up in each other. And that in this part of the world, where indigenous peoples live, and this is their home, this is their territory, this is where they've been sovereign, that if we're going to arrive and seek to, do, to live here, that we have to establish proper relations. So that took place. Um, that was December 23rd, 1854. After that time, an entirely different narrative emerged. For whatever lunatic reasons in British Columbia history, there's a lot of debate about exactly what happened, but effectively they shifted. And for some reason in BC, they decided, you know what? I think we can just pretend none of that stuff matters. That Aboriginal title doesn't really exist. That Aboriginal rights and their, the continuity of their legal rights is something we can ignore. And that, you know what, the relationship between us and Aboriginal peoples, it doesn't really matter. We don't matter to each other. And it's that ugly turn 
that decision to shift into such a profoundly different pattern that is what uh, has laid out the last century and longer of relations between us. It's what's been at the core of the Indian land question. You know, they called it an Indian land question, not a global question of is the Canadian crown acting lawfully or in a fair way or any other questions. It's, oh, the Indians have some questions about their Aboriginal title. And so great leaders like Andy Paul, I want to recognize my relation, Deborah Jacobs here from Squamish. There was a man from Squamish, Andy Paul. He was in every way a lawyer except for not being allowed to have the paper. He was, a, he was a profoundly powerful advocate in the courts for our people. He would be in court on a regular basis, both as an advocate and as a lawyer, or as an interpreter. He was like a shkwikwa for our people in a lot of different ways. But he was part of uh, one of the groups, uh, every single major Aboriginal group in this province for the last century and longer including the ones that he gathered up 100 years ago, the Allied Tribes of British Columbia, were all gathered up around that basic question. What about our Aboriginal title? Um, and so it became the Indian land question. And Indigenous peoples have been standing up for well over a century. Sometimes in quiet, dignified ways, sometimes in angry, frustrated ways, uh, saying, we've missed something here. The relationship is, uh, is, is not grounded in the right way around recognition of our Aboriginal title. It's not right, it's not just, it's not lawful. We have things to talk about. Yeah, Andy Paul, for his part, after uh, many years of advocacy, him and Peter Kelly, a Haida man that lived with the Snanemo, they were finally asked to go to, uh, to Ottawa. Uh, effectively, it was almost like when you read the history, it's kind of like a little bit, we're sick and tired of hearing about this. We better ask them to come out and really talk. And so the Parliament set up a joint committee of the Senate and Commons in 1927 to hear about the, the, the claims of the Allied Tribes of British Columbia. And so they talked about all of the history. They talked about the law, they talked about the history of the Douglas Treaties, they talked about the outstanding issue of title in this province, and the need for the Crown to engage properly on it. They had a lawyer with them, um, Arthur O'Meara, that was helping to advocate, but he was really a bit of a sideshow. It was, you know, a Andrew Paul and uh, Peter Kelly, they were the main advocates. The response that they got wasn't uh, in 1927 by Canada saying, holy smokes, BC really kind of pulled the wool over our eyes at Confederation. We thought that things were okay in BC. Holy man, were we ever mistaken. We better sort this stuff out. This is going to create a real mess if we don't sort this stuff out. They didn't say any of that. Instead, what they said was, holy man. We don't ever want to hear anything like that again. Let's turn what they just did into a crime. And they amended the Indian Act to make it a statutory offense to ever raise money, to ever hire people like Arthur O'Meara, to ever stand up to advocate about the Indian land issue. It became a statutory offense in 1927. Um, and so we're now deep into the depths of the Crown's policy of denial. Denial of the fact that we matter to each other. And we see how in every way that ugly idea played out. Legally, socially, you know, the residential school system is founded on that basic idea. Aboriginal peoples don't matter. In totality they don't matter. There is no worth to them. They, in fact, are hurting themselves in their own 
indigenous selves and we need to take that out of them because it hurts them. Um, so obviously things were a real mess. I don't want to harp on that. Although I do get into a bit of a rant when I start talking about it. <laughs> uh, you know my, um, my grandmother, Ellen, Ellen White, Colossal White, she says, uh, grandson, you have to, when you're talking to people, when you're trying to help them understand what you're saying, you need to find ways to really reach out to them. And um, she said, you have to be light. You can't be, you can't be lecturing. You can't be like preachy because people get closed off. You need to open up and you have to have them open and receptive to what you're saying. And she said, uh, humor is uh, one way to do that. People are laughing if you're able to be on the same page of them in that regard, then that's a good thing. So this stuff, I can't find any jokes about these things. Like, <laughs> for years I've been trying to think, of, what are some, I should figure out some jokes about the Aboriginal title and this and that, but it's, it's never, I've never really found a, a, good, a good place for that. Um, because it's hard, you know, it's hard, hard stuff. It's hard history. But I want to talk about, so that, that's the train wreck that the country had been and had become. And we're still dealing with that train wreck in real ways. And legally speaking, there's been a number of important streams of reconciliation or of people seeking to try to overcome and to get beyond the mess that manifests in so many different ways, including underrepresentation of Aboriginal peoples in work. Uh, legally speaking, uh, it was in fact the legal area where there was the most traction at the outset. In, in after that, the law that I talked about prohibiting advocacy was repealed in 1951. And then it was uh, cases like the, the very first major case was the White and Bob litigation about the Douglas Treaties of my people in the 1960s. That's when you get the Snanebo being supported by their relations on the island, Southern Vancouver Island, all standing together legally, financially, politically to help with that litigation. And that we brought in Tom Berger. He was then a very young lawyer uh, on the appeal work. Uh, Clifford and David, uh, Clifford White, I should say, and David Bob, they are the two men that were, uh, they were uh, arrested for hunting deer out of season. And just really quickly, uh, they stood up in court to say uh, the, the, their defense, their answer to the charge of hunting deer out of season. They said, uh, our answer is we have a treaty of peace between our peoples and the crown that recognizes our right to hunt in accordance with our own laws and traditions. And they were effectively admonished for talking in those ways by the, by the magistrate, Magistrate Beaver Potts. He, um, you know, so powerful. We're now, what, 110 years of denial narratives? The official stories, Aboriginal title doesn't matter. And because that doesn't matter, of course, Douglas treaties don't matter. None of that stuff matters. And so you get 110 years later, you get Magistrate Beaver Pot saying, well, what the hell are these Indians talking about? Everybody knows there was never treaties made in British Columbia. Like, he was uh, dumbstruck, right? He was like, this is madness. This is nonsense. And he actually called, uh, when he convicted them, he called them pigs for daring to talk about it, like they were being greedy. He said, Clifford, it's pure piggishness on your part to be talking about this alleged treaty in my courtroom. The very fact that the issue in that case was, was a treaty made in 1854 or wasn't a treaty made in 1854? Because we had the oral history, they stood up on their oral history and talked about it, and the Crown was like, we deny that there ever, there, there's no such thing as a treaty from the 1850s on this island. We don't know what these people are talking about. Really amazing, amazing stuff, like totally denying the basic facts of history. But that's, that's where they were at, out of necessity, to support their, their ongoing narratives, their, the, the ongoing status quo. And so, you know, through that, 
appeal up to the Supreme Court of Canada, brought in Tom Berger. Frank Calder was an important political ally. He was an MLA then at the time. Uh, Maisie Hurley, the editor of the Native Voice, was one that brought in Tom Berger. Guy Williams from the Native Brotherhood. Uh, all of these important political supports from around the province helping with that litigation and got to that successful conclusion in the Supreme Court of Canada in the mid-1960s that said, yes, in fact, there is a treaty. Holy smokes, there's a treaty. And what it means is that it pushes back on provincial jurisdiction. The Provincial Game Act cannot apply to interfere with the continuity of the treaty rights of the Stanemo peoples. Very powerful statement, holy smokes. Powerful, pushing jurisdiction back. The province has no constitutional scope to interfere with Douglas Treaty rights. So powerful statement. And what in that case, though, it was interesting because what they argued was they said in the fir our first line of argument is that there was a treaty. If the court does not agree with that, then our secondary arguments are that we're going to talk about the Aboriginal title and Aboriginal rights of the Slanemo. So it's up to you. You either acknowledge that there was a treaty or you're going to deal with our title and our rights. And in that one case, they effectively, you know, they mapped out all of the litigation that's happened since. Amazing stuff, really remarkable. And, um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the very first major Aboriginal title case was born out of Tom Berger and Frank Calder running with those arguments in the Nishka context in that powerful way that they did. That, that was the big turning point, the big shift that started to change the politics. Right? It's, been the, it's been the legal process that has been the wedge pushing political views back and creating a necessity for new space because we see in the, one of the, one of the, the, the height <coughs> of denial was manifest in the white paper of 1969 from the original Trudeau and Chrétien when he was the Minister of, uh, of Indian Affairs. They put the white paper forward in 1969 that said effectively, it effectively said when we think about this country, when we think about Canada, we see a, a country full of prosperous people, hardworking people, people with equal rights. We don't, we, we can't envision um, this anachronistic idea that Aboriginal peoples have special rights does not fit with the way we think about this country. He called, Abori he called treaty rights and Aboriginal title historical might have beens. He used that phrase in an in in interview on the West Coast here in Vancouver in the 60s and 70s, early 70s. And so that was the, that was the prevailing vision that this country, if we're going to fulfill what we're intended to be, Aboriginal peoples can't be Aboriginal. They can't be different and distinct. We all have to be the same together. And so the, the first thing that pushed them off of that position was, of course, the, the political actions of Indigenous peoples across the country standing up. It was a, very, it was a unifying threat to Aboriginal peoples across the country. The white paper gave birth to the Assembly of First Nations effectively. Right? The National Indian Brotherhood that became the AFN was born out of the collective thread of the white paper. Um, but it was really the when the Calder litigation went to the Supreme Court of Canada and the Supreme Court said we agree in part with the Nishka, the Aboriginal title is a reality. Uh, we're just not certain if it's still there or not, but absolutely it's a part of the common law of this country. And they found a technical reason not to make an actual decision, which opened up a very long period of time of courts being uh, kind of judicially uh, lacking in courage, judicial cowardice of actually making a decision. So they found a cute legal technical reason to, we'll say, we'll, we'll state the theory about Aboriginal title, but there's no way we're making a decision about Aboriginal title. That began in 1973, 
in the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Calder. But the effect of the, so what the court's intent was, you know, when we're looking at the legal and the, how do the legal, how does the legal function, and how does it relate to the political and the social, in the Canadian context, the legal process was saying, these are kind of issues that are, you know, we're, we can talk about the legal theory, but really this is more of a political issue and it should be sorted out somewhere else. And so it, it truly did have an impact on the politics because uh, the original Prime Minister Trudeau, to his credit, did in fact admit that he was wrong. You know, this is a, this is a basic sh issue playing out right now in American presidential politics, right? Everybody's freaking out because Trump is sort of indicating that he's going to have no respect for the judiciary. And that's like, this is like sacred stuff. You don't fool around with this stuff. And, uh, but in, um, in that case, so Trudeau said, well, I was wrong. Clearly I was wrong, so let's figure this stuff out. And that became the foundation of the first comprehensive claims policy, federally speaking. We will negotiate with the Nishka in relation to their claims to Aboriginal title. So that was an important shift, the, the beginning political shift. Um, Another sort of a, a place where the legal and the political process lined up was in 1982, when the Constitution was repatriated. There were all kinds of complicated fights, including the Berger Trudeau affair. It was called where, where uh, Judge Justice Berger. He was then he was appointed to the bench, the BC Supreme Court, uh, and then when they were repatriating the Constitution, there was initial talk about Aboriginal rights being an important part of the new constitutional statement. And then the Trudeau government again, the Trudeau government, the next one, not, not the current one, but like the second iteration of the original Trudeau, <laughs> said, oh, you know what, actually, I think we're going to leave the Aboriginal rights out. And that's when uh, Justice Berger stood up, along with, of course, all the Aboriginal advocates, to say, uh, that's not on, that's not right. And uh, he had to resign from the bench because of it, because of this sort of this distinction between legal process and politics. Um, major, highest, most authoritative voice that exists in this country of Canada, its constitutional voice speaking, saying the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. You could spend a hundred years trying to get a more straightforward, simple, clear statement. You couldn't achieve it. Recognition, affirmation. Um, but remarkable how little's been done with it. The um, so this the the legal process the has affected the political process. The political process has affected affected the legal process. We've got right up until the summer of two thousand and fourteen, which I want to get to, the Chilcot Nation decision. Um, there wasn't a single. The, the courts refused to, to make a decision. Through Dalgamook, they found cute technical reasons not to make a decision. The early uh, litigation and uh, the trial and appeal level of uh, the Chilcot Nation decision, very, you know, in the trial level decision, very powerful statements about reconciliation. Very powerful statements about the scope and the expansiveness of Aboriginal title. But once again, a total refusal to make an actual legal declaration. And it was all because, you know, the, the, the sort of this tension that exists between the courts and the politics. The judges really, truly believing that this is not part of their scope. This is something to be determined in the political sphere. And so that you know, decade after decade of judges saying to the politicians, for God's sakes, go and sit down and sort this stuff out. Please, sort it out. And they gave them time, they gave them decades. Um, the Hulkamedian peoples, in uh, I guess close to a decade ago now, the Hulkamedian Treaty Group, they did a very powerful, interesting thing. The Cowichan or a major part of that work. They went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington, D.C. And they said to that Inter-American Commission, 
They said, we want you to say something about the fact that in Canada, at home, we have no way to have our Aboriginal title respected, recognized, demarcated, delineated, in any way at all. And that fact offends our human rights. And we want you to say something about that. And Canada's immediate response in a procedural sort of, before you can get into the substance of that, they said, as a matter of procedure, um, we want to knock the Halkomenum Treaty Group back into Canada. They have no right to be here. In international law, there's a basic sort of proce procedural uh, rule about uh, you, you can only have standing in the international forum if you've exhausted your domestic remedies. And so Canada went to the Inter-American Commission and said, they told this big story about how uh, the Halkomenum have no right to be here because they could have either gone to the courts to have their title established or they could have uh, gone to the treaty process to have their title established. And in response to that claim, indigenous peoples across the country, individual First Nations, Aboriginal organizations told the story of litigation in this country, the legal process, told the story that after four decades after tens upon tens of millions of dollars spent on litigation about Aboriginal title, there has never been a single grain of sand in the second largest country on the face of this earth that any Canadian judge has ever declared to be Aboriginal title. After four decades of litigation, they have not provided one single remedy to Indigenous peoples. And they said the BC Treaty process, for its part, quite the opposite of recognizing and implementing title, it actually, the mandates that the Crown brings requires Indigenous peoples to set aside their Aboriginal title and to take something else in its place. So it's not about implementation or recognition of Aboriginal title in any way at all. The Inter-American Commission, after hearing all of these uh, stories and arguments, they agreed with the Halkomenum Treaty Group. A very embarrassing decision for Canada. Holy smokes. The Inter-American Commission said there are no effective domestic remedies in Canada for Aboriginal peoples in relation to Aboriginal title. And so we will hear what the Halkomenum peoples have to say about this. Very embarrassing for both Canada politically speaking and then legally speaking. This, is, this becomes an important foundation of what emboldened the Supreme Court of Canada in the summer of 2014. After the trial level decision in Chilcotin, just late Justice Vickers painted an expansive picture of title and, and jurisdictional implications. Then it went to the BC Court of Appeal and we get Justice Groberman's disgusting, racist, 19th century reiteration of what Aboriginal title is. He actually, and without a word of a lie, he said, when you're fishing, if you're looking for your Aboriginal title, when you're fishing, look down at the rock that you're standing on. That's the extent of your Aboriginal title. This isn't about territorial sovereignty. Aboriginal peoples don't have relationships with large spaces. It was very, it was shocking. And it was a gift for us because it was such a horrible statement of the ugly ideas at the core of that, that reflect the idea that we don't matter to each other. He said things like, uh, Aboriginal title is very limited in what it can be because it could never, there's no scope for Aboriginal title to interfere in any way at all with the sovereignty of Canada. So very much a us, them sort of conception of the universe, right? So you take those two things, you take this Inter-American Commission, that's like a, what a statement about the failure of the BC Treaty process, in part, Part of the reason why Justice Vickers didn't make a decision because there was a BC treaty process. Part of the reason why in Delgamook they didn't make a decision, the courts, because there's political discussions going on over here. 
But when those political discussions are not productive of anything over a generation, that basic argument and dynamic breaks down. So by the summer of 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada had been backed into a corner by political failure after political failure over the course of a generation. Starting from the failed political conversations or uh, conferences that were held post-1982, the constitutional conferences that were intended to be a discussion, high-level discussion about what is this country all about and what's our proper relationship. What is Section 35 intended to do for us, for all of us together? That was a political shamazel, right? Failed. There was no political will to redefine the country. All of those failures, all of the embarrassing decisions of international forums, it, it backed the Supreme Court of Canada into a corner where they had to say, is there going to be a continuing role for the legal process in this country or not about these critical issues like Aboriginal title? Because we should probably answer Aboriginal peoples now. It's been 40 years. They spent tens of millions of dollars, untold opportunity costs. We should probably let them know if maybe this issue just isn't justiciable. Maybe we've got a political questions doctrine like in the United States at play here in Canada about Aboriginal title. That's what that, that was, that became the big question for the court when it made its decision about the Chilcotin Nation uh, Aboriginal title claim. Major historic decision. Probably one of the most important historic decisions the court has ever issued. Of profound and sweeping consequence saying to the politicians effectively in unstated ways, you have completely failed. You have made a mess of this. And we are not going to allow you to bring the repute of the legal process of, country into, of this country into the question any longer. We will make our decision about Aboriginal title once and for all. We will provide an answer to the Indian land question now. And here it is. Aboriginal title is of, is of uh, territorial significance. It's across landscapes. It's not Justice Groverman's rock. It's a people's relationship to their territory. Over you know, 2,000 square kilometers that have been claimed by the Chilcotin peoples was recognized. And just the very fact like what a massive shockwave for Aboriginal title to finally come into shape, to take form, to manifest in the world. I don't know how I haven't been up there yet. I do work for the Chilcotin Nation government now in relation to consent. And uh, I, need, I, I feel like I want to make a pilgrimage up to that Aboriginal title land. What an astonishing legal, political, economic, and social development in this country. You know, an important part of the, the decision, this consent principle, talks about jurisdiction. Just really quickly, I think this is important because it talks about a fundamental shift in relations. Does everybody know about the duty to consult? Right? Like, holy man, what a... What an intense bit of work that's been over the past decade since the Haida Nation decision. But here's what is important to know about the duty to consult in this moment. The duty to consult is fundamentally premised on the idea that there is only one decision maker in this country and that is the Crown. That they have all of the jurisdiction, all of the authority to make the decision. And because of that, the honor of the crown is at play with respect to decision making about Aboriginal interests or potential Aboriginal interests. <coughs> and it's this honor of the crown, this you know, legal notion that constrains them in their decision making power 
They must go as part of their decision-making power, go and engage with Aboriginal peoples, but then ultimately, you know, go and talk to them. This is the decision we want to make. This is what it's going to look like. What do you have to say about it? Ultimately, they'll go back and they make their decision. That's the Haida Nation model of consultation and accommodation. What the Chilcotin Nation decision says is something fundamentally different. When it talked about decision making in this country, it talked about how the indigenous people's relationship to their Aboriginal title lands includes decision making power, jurisdiction, authority. They didn't use those words, but that's effectively what it is. It's a governmental relationship of a people to their shared lands. So there's not just one decision maker anymore in the world. There's now two. And it's that reality that gives rise to the need for consent between those two. That there's decision making that's engaged by both. So it's a major fundamental shift in a real way out of uh, the, the, the hundred years and longer of denial. The fact, you don't matter, you don't matter, you don't matter. Okay, you matter because I've got to consult with you, but really you don't matter. I'm going to make my decision. It's now we're shifting into something profoundly different from that. And the legal process, for its part, has always refused to deal with and, and grab a hold of the idea of uh, the self-determination powers of Aboriginal people, self-government. It's the big smoking hole in the whole body of Canadian Aboriginal law. There is no crystal clear statements about self-government. It's not there. It's always been a very, very scary thing. You don't talk about sovereignty in Canadian <coughs> courts. You do not use that word over the past generation in Canadian courts. You don't talk about Aboriginal sovereignty. You just don't. Um, so, it's a big shift. Uh, it's a very important part of upending the status quo and defining the moment that we're in. Uh, politically speaking, we also have uh, some of the most important documents, like Section 35 of the Constitution I've already talked about. There's also the more recent UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which, uh, which both is... You know, it's, a, it's now a, a, a new statement, globally speaking, of the rights of indigenous peoples that covers a, a wide range of different uh, issues and people's relationship to their lands, protection from things like residential schools, um, the, the right of free, prior, and informed consent. The new federal government has uh, committed to implement it. The provincial government of Alberta has committed to implement the declaration. Um, here in BC, uh, we're not in that situation. It's troubling. And I think this speaks to the role of uh, academic institutions. When you have governments that don't know what to do, not sure where to go, then uh, the role, I think, of universities and academics writing in these areas becomes ever more critical and important. You need to lead. You need to think through these difficult issues. You need to think about this moment and what it means about how things have to be different and what that looks like and why. Right? It's a, not a moment to replicate Edward Sapir's blindness to these issues. It's a moment to bring a sharp focus of leadership to these issues. So there's been a lot of important political streams that have not really, in the big picture, meant a lot on the ground yet for Indigenous peoples. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, they took, uh, I, I think that they're, what an amazing amount of work, but I think what's important about it for this talk is that it really focused on the social aspect. And it's something that really resonates with me because in my own work as a leader, I've really sort of given emphasis to different parts of, of my work in different times. 
when I was chief, I, I used legal and political stuff in very strong and aggressive ways to achieve a reconciliation agreement in Snanemo. I quadrupled my people's land base, but did nothing to address the social reality of my people. The stuff that you guys are talking about, right? That you're turning your minds to. What the hell, what is this all about that we don't have people working with us, indigenous peoples? Why are they overrepresented in the negative things in Canadian society and underrepresented in the positive spaces? That's the stuff that troubles me now. I know I can, I can go in and use the hyper adversarial law and that stuff to, to start to make headway, but it doesn't answer the fundamental questions that I've pointed to a few times now when people have thought about what is this, what is this country, what is this space, these relations that exist within this place that's called Canada, what should they be like? How should we be relating to each other? Do we matter to each other or not? Should we be wrapped up in each other's lives or not? If we're going to achieve reconciliation, what does it look like and why? Um, this government in BC struggles with that. So far they seem to think that they can just push ahead in the status quo. We've had two major conferences between the BC government and Indigenous leadership post Chilcote the last two Septembers in a row. The most substantive announcement by the provincial government was the creation of a new Aboriginal youth scholarship. That's it. That's the most substantive thing they've said in the almost two years since the Chilcotin Nation decision. It's unbelievable. It's lunacy. And um, it's really going to start to cause problems in the economic realm first start to shift into the legal if we don't if we don't build the path together if we don't recognize the moment we're in and start to grapple with it together to build uh, new patterns new ways forward together then it will continue the conflict will deepen the uncertainty will grow it'll become a further mess if you look at it in individual sectors like forestry, the forestry economy won't exist in five to ten years if BC doesn't take its head out of the sand. And so I gave a talk at the Faculty of Forestry in the fall after the Chilcote Nation decision. I said to them, I said, you have a real duty to stand up. You have a duty to understand what this decision means for this industry. And you have a duty to educate the government about that. Right? You need to put that, put your views forward, your thoughtful views. You know, the center that I'm the director of exists because of my recognition of how important the academic space is for our broader work, the social change aspect of our work. I, we we co-hosted a conference at VI, with VIU and the Stanemo about the treaty history, pre-confederation treaties. And it was fundamentally different from a conference downtown, you know, or like a legal conference or a political conference, whatever. When you move it into the academic setting, the nature of engagement and discourse changes mm -hmm. in very important ways that I think creates the real, it's, it's the place where the best version of our country, the best version of reconciliation has to be born. One where we thought of thoughtful recognition of the problems and thoughtful recognition of each other. That we care about each other. That this is stuff that's worthy of giving attention and time to, to think about, to write about. Help to, to help to illuminate the world about these issues and these realities. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think it very specifically was aimed at the social aspect, social engagement, public education and engagement, the, the six or seven national forums across the country. The very specific term, turn away from 
and the Sanemo and other people that said we're going to drag this person into court and make them accountable, that kind of uh, you know, criminal justice aspect, a turn away from that, in fact, to some kind of amnesty, which I still struggle with, knowing my mother was at the Alberta Residential School in the years they were treated like lab rats when, when, people, when medical experiments were happening. In relation to my family, my peoples, and we're and we're what we're talking about amnesty. Thousands of people testifying about horrendous abuse and violence against them. Not one person prosecuted, not one person held accountable, not one person thrown in jail because of the horrors that were shared through the truth and reconciliation process. Why is that? Why was it structured that way? You know, it was very much aimed at something different. Instead of justice per se, reconciliation. Um, you know, I read, a, I read an article recently about uh, reconciliation efforts in Africa done by an American university that said reconciliation is damaging to the victims. The processes of reconciliation, when we look, when we do the analysis of reconciliation processes that have taken place in those African countries that have been torn apart and they bring victims and offenders together, you know, where horrible things have happened and they say, let's try and move into, we, we need to reconcile as a country well, the end result, at least from that one study, was that that's a damaging, it's a, a process that is further damaging to the victims. Raising and bringing forward and bringing to mind these atrocities and these horrors is psychologically damaging. So, but the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that whole process, that whole agreement shifted out of the legal and adversarial to we need to understand what happened as a country, as a people, collective people, and we need to understand what are the necessary bits of work we need to do in terms of reconciliation. So very sort of future-oriented. Um, very broad in scope. I think it can be criticized for that. People will look at it and go, what's this Truth and Reconciliation Commission think it's doing, talking about all these things? But I think it's the recognition that we have to understand the broader reality of the moment of all the different streams, the legal, political, social, economic, to properly understand what we, the, the moment that we have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. That it's all of these things together that we need to take into consideration as we uh, move forward together. Does everybody know about the Laurier Memorial? From up in the interior? 1910, Shushwap chiefs up in Kamloops met with uh, Wilfred Laurier, the Prime Minister at the time, who was in Kamloops, and they went and talked to him. And they shared a beautiful story, a very powerful sort of narrative that they talked about, about their history to that point and what their views were and where they wanted to go. And um, they talked about uh, the very early history, and they talked about what some of the chiefs were thinking at that time about how things should go. And they, it never came, they said that this vision never came to be, and so we ask you to engage with us, to acknowledge that we matter. But this is one of the, a quote from one of the chiefs that was reflecting upon the way they understood when people came. They talked about their territories as their houses. When strangers come to live with us in our house, what, what are the basic teachings that we have about how we should be? And they say, these, this is a quote from one of the chiefs talking. These people wish to be partners with us in our country. We must, therefore, be the same as brothers to them and live as one family. We will share equally in everything, half and half, 
in land, water, and timber, and so on. What is ours will be theirs, and what is theirs will be ours. We will help each other to be great and good. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Holy man. I think that's part of, this is, it. I, I always come back to this Laurier Memorial. That's 1910, over a century ago. Words shared with the Prime Minister of the day about uh, what we want in terms of a proper relationship that's reflected in these ideas. This idea that we will help each other to be great and good. I think that's so true. I think it's important to understand when we think, you know, things like about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, a society can't inflict that kind of harm on damage on an aspect of itself without horribly disfiguring itself in that process, without massively damaging itself. It's been hurt. It's diminished itself. It's lessened itself. We're in a state where um, I think if we work together, we can achieve great things. We can be great and good, but we must do it together. It's the only path. It's the only way. And so when you think about this stuff you guys are talking about, about work, think about just, you know, like universities, like where I'm at, VIU. Massive Aboriginal population. And where we've just taken baby steps so far in terms of having the workforce reflect the diversity of the Aboriginal peoples and the proportion of the Aboriginal peoples that are in the student body. Just baby steps. And um, that's, a, that's an important thing to grapple with, to figure out. You know, the, I, I think it's a really, as I said at the, at the very beginning, the opening, I think that work is such an important part of our identity that it has to be, it has to unfold in a healthy and good and a strong way. That is a place that if you were able to change workforce in a serious way, it's when you start to really change society and the way people think about each other and the, the way they think about themselves. Because I think it's fair to say quite often, work is the primary defining aspect of a person's psychology and identity. And so I think there's a lot of very fertile ground there to make headway, to overcome, to help people get to know each other in important ways uh, is in the workforce. So the work that you guys are doing is very, I think it's very important. And I really acknowledge you and uh, I want to share my respect with you that you're spending your time on such a critical issue. And I wish you all the best. And uh, I hope that what I've shared and what I've said you find useful. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind these broader narratives when we're thinking about the specifics, the, 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 the very specific areas that we're working in. They're interconnected to the bigger uh, unfolding of all of this. So thank you. Thank you.